So today, this is a webinar about uh, product leadership. And uh, basically, uh, that's very much useful for product and service organization to know how to bring a product or a service to uh, the market. Uh, Day Thinking Academy, uh, why uh, is it D? It's because of uh, different thinking, different doing, different being. So we do help companies, we do help organizations to uh, think differently in order to uh, better meet uh, the market and the customer expectations. That's what we do. And uh, we do it uh, via uh, trainings like the uh, uh, design thinker or the sustainable designer or UX designer or service designer. And uh, we do it also via uh, leadership or facilitation uh, uh, trainings uh, in order to uh, bring uh, new ways of working to, uh, to, uh, uh, to people. And we provide uh, certificates, uh, digital certificates that you can uh, publish on your LinkedIn profile. So that it was uh, about uh, day thinking. Uh, just about me, uh, why am I, uh, let's say, uh, credible in terms of uh, product management? In fact, I've been uh, working in one of the most successful uh, startups uh, in Europe. I would say the, the high-tech startup uh, in Europe, ISML. It is basically uh, three times the size of uh, Airbus. Uh, that's an high-tech uh, equipment company uh, providing uh, equipments to the semiconductor industry. And uh, I've been working over there as a innovation lead or a product managers. And uh, this company, so I cannot say we anymore, I'm not there anymore, but they relentlessly bring value to customers through innovation. So their focus is how can we bring value to the customer? And they survived and now they are the, the top in the market. They have even a monopoly because they, they pushed very, very far this notion of value, value of ownership. So which value do they bring to the owner of equipment, the seller and software? So that's really the key of everything. And that's the task of the product manager or product leader or product owner, doesn't matter how you call him. His goal is to help the organization to bring value to the, to the final customer. Whatever, whatever the, the product or the service, it can be digital, it can be hardware, it can be anything. So what does it mean for you uh, as an organization, as a, a professional? It means that you need to be centered on the user. That's, that's the key. You as a product manager, but the entire organization have to be centered on the user. And it pays off. So that's a, a survey done by uh, McKinsey. And they showed uh, quantitatively that the organizations, the companies that are design-centric or user-centric, they have a much, much better performance than anybody else. So in terms of uh, growth, revenue growth, and in terms of returns to shareholders as well. And uh, they are not the only one to say it, huh? but uh, Steve Jobs, for instance, he said, you have got to start with a customer experience. I would rather say the customer needs and work back toward the technology, not the other way around. And, and that's very logical. If you focus on your customer and you deliver, deliver something that he wants, is going to buy your product and uh, is going to buy again and again because he can see, he can feel, he can experience that you do your best to meet his needs or her needs. And this is true as well for high tech. This is not only for consumer products, also for high tech, for B2B, uh, it is very, very much true as well. Uh, and you start with uh, desirability, uh, what people desire. That's the key of everything. When you can succeed to find that, it's not that difficult to create a business around it. As soon as you meet a critical need, you will be capable to sell it, to find a way to sell it. And technically nowadays, there is no limit. You can see it with uh, Elon Musk uh, uh, getting his car in the, in the space within, a, let's say, 10, 15 years of development. So it's not only people, desirability, but also what the business desires. Yeah. So. That's exactly the same if it is a consumer product or a B2B product. 
And, and often nowadays, the customer experience is everything. You can see that in the, in the banking industry, for instance. The, the, the customer experience is sometimes the main differentiator and sometimes even the only one. So I like this example with uh, Richard Branson, Virgin. He was in a very, very competitive industry and he succeeded by, let's say, providing uh, a very, very nice experience to, um, to, uh, to everyone. He succeeded to, uh, to, to create really uh, a company. Uh, and there are many, many stories uh, about him uh, trying to give the best experience ever to uh, his clients. So he was capable to create uh, what we call magic moments. So it's not only to remove the, the points of friction, but it's also to create moments, wow moments. Clients who think, wow, wow, this company did that for me. And what they do, they spread the word. They say, wow, Virgin, they did that for me, or whatever. So you can see that a bit with uh, Airbnb. So uh, Airbnb, they create a, a, frictionless, uh, a frictionless experience to rent uh, something, and they are capable to create a wow moments. So for instance, they really care about their clients. When those clients, they, they, for instance, they, they, the, the, the housing uh, does not meet their, exper their expectation. They are capable to bounce back and to propose something else. Or during the COVID, they were also quite, uh, quite easy with the clients to support them. And, uh, and it pays off. If you look at uh, Airbnb in 2008, they just started. I mean, just uh, a few years later, New York, they were spreading very, very fast. So their, their business model, uh, their value proposition was, was very, very good for the host and for the clients, uh, the ones staying in the apartments or the houses. So what makes the difference between one company and uh, another company? That's the culture. The culture is the most important. The culture is like the roots of a tree and the organization is going to, to, to breathe from it. And uh, you need to have an alignment inside the organization related to your culture. And this culture needs to be customer centric. That's the key of everything. I would say that's the only differentiator for any, any company. And Amazon got it right. Right from the start, it was, it did build a culture that is very, very customer centric. And, and everything, the methods, the ways of working, the organization uh, was built around this customer centricity. So it means that for any, any single company, that we have to move from a process-centric company to a product or service-centric company. And I would even say to a user-centric company as the next step. And that's not something that is done in one go. It takes time. It really takes a lot of time to build such a, uh, such a culture. So how to get it done? Uh, as I said already, that's not something easy. So uh, product management, uh, let's say you have an end-to-end -end, uh, innovation process. And if you go to designguides.org, uh, that's uh, an end-to-end -end innovation process with a succession of teams. And every single team is focused on the user, uh, on the final user. And you can see that with a small icon at the top of each team. So every single team during this innovation process, end-to-end, they are focusing on, on meeting the needs of the final users. So process is indeed something very, very important. And here you can see that uh, before it was a kind of sequential process. And in fact, that's a kind of iterative process. You can always go back to the previous team if something is not, not clear or not good enough. So this is true for every single team, iterative on itself and also between the teams, all along this end-to-end -end innovation process. So you start with a design team, you follow with a development team, the growth team, the sustaining team, 
and you can go back to the growth team or to the development team and you can do loops like that all the time to improve the product or the service or to invent a new product or a new service. So no innovation process, no success. That's the key. Creativity, innovation, it doesn't mean we, do any, we, we can do anything. No, we, it is structured. There is a, a, a process, an innovation process to, to, to succeed. And the product manager needs to master this innovation process. So that's about building fast the right things right. And that's something that is uh, very, very crucial. Uh, so first of all, you need to define the value. So that's to find this, uh, this uh, fit between a problem and a solution, or this fit between a market and a product. And when you got it right, in that case, you can deliver the value. So it means you can build uh, this thing and you can build it right. So that's first building the right things. So what do we want to provide as a value proposition? If you don't get that right, no need to go further. When this is validated, you can move to the step of developing. So delivering the value. You start with the MVP, minimum viable product. You have a product backlog and step-by-step, step, you're going to get the product evolving in order to continuously uh, provide more value to the customer. And after that, you have to show the value. So that's about growing fast. And, and uh, because nowadays you have to go to the market as quickly as possible. And you do that with those successes team in order to do it fast. So that's about accelerating the time to value. So with uh, a governance that is uh, more shared with uh, self-organized teams and blah, blah, blah. That's about building fast. So what is the bigger risk for a product? So the bigger risk for a product that's basically building something that nobody wants. So amazing, huh? And uh, you can see that in big organization. I mean, we can spend sometimes uh, hundreds of thousands of euro or millions of euro. And uh, we can see on the way that uh, it's not going to meet any customer needs, but we continue. Because most of the time we are in a kind of sequential product and we are not capable to stop it, to kill it and to start again. You can see it with startup as well, but with startup that's easier. I mean, uh, very quickly, they run out of cash and they are out of the market. So it's not because you are a startup that you build something that somebody wants, to the contrary. So that's really in your mindset. You need to be very much focused on that. So what is true for startup? It is true for business. There is no difference, except that a big business uh, can make a few mistakes. A startup cannot make that many. That's the only difference. So, uh, so this one is more about a, a French product. It was uh, some years back after some uh, terrorist attacks, the government decided to uh, release or to develop uh, an app. And uh, it was to inform uh, the citizens of the terrorist attack and they expected all the French people to download it. They got uh, something uh, like a 30,000 downloads. In fact, nobody did use it. Nobody cared. So the, the, this idea was, uh, not meeting the need, or at least not in the way they push it to the market. What they did later was to use Facebook to inform about uh, any, uh, any terrorist act. So it was something that was decided based on emotions and not really based on the need of users, of the citizens. Something else more uh, interesting, and I think we, uh, we got that uh, all over in Europe, it was this uh, app uh, related to COVID. So at the beginning, uh, nobody was uh, using it. And uh, step by step, uh, people started using it because iteratively, they improved the value proposition of this app. And it was possible to show that we were vaccinated with this app and not anymore with a piece of paper and blah, blah, blah. So at the beginning, nobody did care about it. And step by step, by iteration, they provided more value to the users. So it means that uh, uh, if you really want to care about the user, you need to understand the user. You need to understand the problem, their problems. And Albert Einstein, he says that, okay, you have to spend a lot, a lot of time to define the problem before, before thinking, 
before developing the solution. When you think about it, it's very, very right that in our organization, we have the tendency to do the opposite, to develop something and to think only after about the user. And the product manager, his responsibility is to invest money of the organization only when he's sure enough or when she's sure enough that he can get a return on investment. And the return investment comes from the fact that we have a fit between a problem and uh, the needs of users and, be and between a product and the market. So to do that, you are going to do some uh, quantitative analysis and some qualitative analysis and, and in order to better understand the problem. So the first part is really the problem definition. When this one is clear, it's much, much easier to think about solutions and you can design solutions. And you do that iteratively because you are going to test it and to see if yes or no, uh, it's going to work. So when we talk about IT uh, and business, so you can see that uh, on the IT side or hardware side or whatever, so they are responsible for the technology and they are also partly responsible for the design. So they should work uh, hand in hand with a business in order to uh, design something that is going to meet the needs of the market, the needs of the users. So you can see that uh, the border between IT and business is highly critical. And the, this is the role of the product leader, of the product manager, of the product owner, to build fast, better products. And they do that by connecting, in fact, the business, so métier in French, and the IT side, and they can do it with some design thinking sprint to get everybody aligned about what needs to be developed for our customers, for their customers. And that's a product-centric uh, culture. This product-centric culture is, is, uh, is the key. So product, uh, it can be a lot of different things. It can be goods, it can be services. It meets a need. That's the definition of it. It's whatever, whatever it is, it meets the need of users. So the difference between a project and a product is that a project has an end. We know when it stops. A product, it never stops till it reaches its end of life. So basically we remove it from the market. So you can see the difference you can see the difference between a project-based organization and a product-based organization. So it doesn't mean that you don't have any project huh, in a product-based organization, but, but the, the mindset is quite different. So you have a, a few laws for a product organization. So the first law is customer, customer, customer. You have to find the product market fit, no other choice. And you have to focus on the value of ownership or, or the use of something uh, and the lead time to bring value. So you need to bring this value as quickly as possible. You don't need to bring a lot of value at the beginning, but you need to be on a roadmap that is going to bring more and more value. So that's the role of the product manager to focus on the customer and to help the organization to focus on the customer. The second law, that's the small teams. So self-organized teams. So those teams, they are autonomous. They don't have to uh, ask all time to the CEO uh, what he thinks or what she thinks about uh, their business ideas. They, they, uh, they are really uh, autonomous and they operate in short iterations and they continuously improve themselves as a team and also uh, on the capability to focus on the customer, on the user. And they are capable, without referring that much to anyone, to quickly pivot uh, in order to um, change their value proposition if the market needs it. So that is important. The third law, the third law is network, network, and again, network. 
most of the time in uh, traditional companies, you have uh, something that is uh, rather bureaucratic, uh, very hierarchical, and you have plenty of useless processes, and that it prevents from getting the work done. So you need to uh, simplify that and to uh, get a lot of informal uh, relations between uh, people in order to speed up the time to value. So to accelerate the time, we bring value to the customers. That's the third law. Uh, that's why uh, some companies are better than others because they are capable to do that much better. So uh, we have to move from a process-centric organization that's what most of the companies are nowadays, to a product-centric organization. That's, that's uh, the key and doesn't, doesn't uh, happen like that uh, overnight. It takes uh, years. And I would say that's even more, uh, it should be a user-centric organization. So product is far too much, again, uh, centered, but something that is inside, the user is outside and he's the one telling us what we have to deliver as product or services. And it takes time. Now you can see that uh, in the world of today, we could even push it further. In fact, our organizations have to move from user-centric to human-centric uh, centric organizations because uh, a company should not focus only on their customers, they should focus on the society. And we can, we can feel that more and more companies are taking this, uh, this turn. They, they consider that they have also a mission that they have to do something for the society and not only for their customers. Okay, so what is the role of the user in the process? Because we talk a lot about the uh, customers, users, and blah, blah, blah. In fact, this user is everywhere in this innovation process end to end. At every single step, you see the user. And each team has to keep in mind, has to interact with the user, has to define persona in order to better understand his or her needs and to, uh, and consequently to perform better in their own market. So the only purpose of an organization is to bring value to the end user. Nothing more. That's the only purpose of organization. It's not to provide work to, uh, to, to, to people working. It's, it's a consequence. Giving work to people is just a consequence of bringing value to others that are outside the organization. So value to user as fast as possible. That's the responsibility of a product manager, of a product leader, of a product owner. That's key. So building fast, the right product, right. But I like, I love this expression. It's, 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 it says it all. So you have all the elements, the product right, uh, to make it right, to have a right product. We are not going to build anything and to do it fast. And it starts with making the right product, of course. So uh, waterfall versus agile methodology. So it does mean that uh, we cannot do both huh? uh, at the same time. Uh, in, in the startup I was working uh, for in the past, we were capable to do uh, both more or less. So the waterfall, so the V model. So first you're going to specify what you want to build during a few months. After that, you are going to build it. After that, you are going to test it. And uh, uh, 18 months later or two years or 10 years later, you have your product. Um, so for a lot of uh, stuff, uh, it makes sense to use this V model, but not for everything. The, especially when uh, the, the, the specifications are changing very fast, the needs are changing very fast. You need to have a, an iterative way of working that is much more value driven. And uh, you can see that in software. So you are much more focused on bringing value very fast and you do that iteratively. And for instance, uh, in terms of uh, agile project management, you have Scrum. Scrum, that's exactly that. Uh, it's basically uh, how to iteratively deliver value to the customers in a very fast way. So you don't wait for one year, two years, whatever. 
but you do that uh, iteratively. So, uh, I love this example of a submarine. You can imagine that a submarine, you don't do that uh, with a, a scrum process, an iterative process. First, you have a V model you are going to specify. Uh, what are the big specifications of uh, your submarine, the shape and everything, and you're going to build it and you're going to test it. And everything inside, you can do it with an agile method, an iterative method, because you need to better understand the needs of users inside. So the submarine is a very good example about what you can do with a V model and what you can do with, uh, with uh, the the agile, the iterative uh, way of working. So now be aware that there is no organization model fitting all organization. In fact, each uh, uh, working model has to be built collaboratively inside the organization and it has to evolve over time. That's the main risk of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, companies adopting an external model because in that case, uh, uh, people working in this organization, they are not going to, they are going to resist to it. They are not going to apply, comply to, uh, to this model. So you have to build it inside with every, not everyone, but with many employees. And we go towards living organizations. So you can see on the left side, you have a more uh, classical organization. And uh, on the right side, what we call an empowering organization. So on the left side, that's something that is more hierarchical and you have the silos. And on the right side, it's more a living system. And you can see that this is much more agile. You can feel that this is more living and uh, with more interaction in a more free way. And for that, it requires a managerial uh, transformation because that's a very, very different mindset you need to have. So uh, this one is just a framework to, uh, to, uh, to assess your organization. So it has different dimensions and you can see uh, uh, what you need to, uh, to assess to see how far you are from the agile organization you would like or the empowering organization. I prefer this word, empowering, because it means that you give the power to the people so they can bring value to the end user. Uh, so that's the role of uh, the, the product manager, and it should be the role of the leaders to bring value to everything, to bring value to the users. So, uh, the product manager, it is a key role, but the most important role, to my opinion, in an organization. And that's more likely the toughest one. Uh, it's, it's, you need to be very, very broad, and it can be very, very political as well. So, it's, it's uh, very key to select uh, those product managers because they are going to have an impact, positive or negative, very important uh, for, for your revenues and for your profit. So the product co-owner, I like the co because it means that this is not, he's not the only one responsible. It, he, he makes co-responsible the teams he's going to work with. So he co-owns the design and the delivery the delivery with the teams, but at the end is ultimately uh, responsible. Uh, um, so for, uh, for hardware, for a uh, software company, I'm used to say that normally it should not be from IT, it should be from a business line. It needs to understand the business to drive, to help the, 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 the innovation side, the research side, the development side to better deliver to, uh, to the customers and is the voice of a customer. So he has a three main task. The first one was to identify the critical issues, to transform into products, uh, bringing value to the user. And he does it uh, on time and better and better. And that, that it's, it's, it's an art, it's not something easy. The second one, you have to prioritize all time, relentlessly. Uh, sometimes abruptly. So you have to stick to the changing needs of the market. You have to stick to it and it's difficult. Even if you are alone in your company, it is difficult to do because you want to maximize the value for the client all the time. And the last one, 
because most of the time you don't have any direct authority. You don't have anybody uh, reporting to you. You work with people reporting to department managers, group leaders, and you have to influence without authority. And you do it only by making co-responsible the teams to deliver value to the final user. So you need to have very, very strong uh, leadership skills uh, to do it. So you have different types of uh, product owners or product managers, uh, and uh, it's associated uh, governance. So uh, let's say uh, okay, you have a scribe, he doesn't do that much. Uh, the proxy is uh, replacing somebody else, it's not so much fun. Okay, the business representative is getting better. So he's aware of the business challenges, the market customers, and he has, he has the power to decide real decisions. Uh, he's autonomous with respect to the management of a product backlog. He has his own budget. But, but the budget is decided by other people. And uh, the strategy and the objectives, they are defined by others. So I've been in this kind of role as a product manager. And the most exciting one, and I'm with this one nowadays, if I was the entrepreneur, you, you are similar to a mini CEO. And more and more companies are asking their product managers to behave in such a way. So you are visionary about your own market and how it's going to change. And, and you are an entrepreneur, so you're responsible for everything, for the, 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 for the PNL uh, and, and for uh, the success and the failures. So you need to be a much better communicator with a real leadership. And, and uh, you need to, uh, to be your product. In fact, you need to, uh, to be the advocate of what you're going to deliver to your customers. And you have the one defining the product strategy and the objectives. So it's, it's much more interesting. It's much more challenging. It's much more rewarding. So organizations, step by step, they go towards this kind of uh, uh, product managers. Not all of them, but this is the one that would give them the, the most uh, uh, possibilities to, uh, to follow uh, the market changes. So now that's another way to look at uh, uh, product management. You can see that um, uh, you can have different types. So for uh, tech-driven companies, so the product manager is going to be uh, uh, very fond of uh, technology. So he's going to have some deep roots in technology. Uh, most of the time, he comes from a, an engineering background. And uh, so you can see that with uh, Amazon Web Services, for instance. Or it can be the generalist, so he knows something about technology and he knows something about business. And he can drive both sides. And, uh, and you can see that for companies that are uh, like platforms, like Airbnb, Facebook, LinkedIn. So you really need to know what it means in terms of platform, you know, to drive R&D, uh, to deliver the best value to the end users. And, and you can have a, a more business-oriented uh, product manager. So you see that with Salesforce, for instance. And uh, he does not know that much about uh, uh, technology behind, but he knows very well. He knows his customers or our customers very well. Okay. Uh, so uh, here, that's to give you a bit of uh, an insight about the core capabilities and how complicated it is as a, as a rock. So you need to be a business acumen. You need to be market oriented. You need to have some strong soft skills, some very deep technical skills, depending on the product management type you want to be. And you need to be uh, very much aware of uh, your customers. So to have very good insights, to have a, to gain a lot of empathy with your users. So you can see that it's a pretty much all around uh, uh, professional. And it's very difficult to, uh, to build all those skills. So you have to focus on the skills you need to build, to acquire, uh, depending on uh, the company you are in. And, and uh, what does he spend his time to? So the, the main task he has to do is to define the product strategy, to uh, collaborate with uh, technical and design functions, to define the product requirements, to engage with customers and partners, and to collaborate with other functions. And uh, planning, maintaining the roadmap, coaching, 
uh, recruiting, pricing, uh, research and market review metrics, that's secondary. It is important, but that's secondary. So you can see that he's very much focused on product and how can we bring value to the end user and to make sure that we do it by working with uh, people developing. So the product manager, he has a left and a right brand. So the right brain, that's more, let's say, the intuitive part. And the left brain, that's more the analytical part. And so the combination is difficult. So that's difficult to find people who can play with both brains. Because that's a kind of art. It is really an art to be a product manager. So right brain, intuition, risk-taking, experiment, and left brain, optimization, data-driven, delivery. So you are looking for a, a ship with five legs, as we say in French, and I think we say it in English as well. So it's not easy to find this type of guys. So how to start? How do you want to start uh, this kind of uh, 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 product-centric organization or user-centric organization? So you have to start small and you have to be persistent and you need to grow your organization. So you have the right intuition, but the problem, the fit between a problem and solution, and later on between a product and a market. And after that, you have to push it and to pivot when needed. And sometimes you have to go through the, the cast. So you, you see that you have, you have it right, but you have to be persistent and you have to change a few things in order to, to cross this cast and to reach the mainstream market. It's not something easy, but you just need to be aware of it. A lot of companies, they fail doing that. Okay, so, and you have to use an innovation process to guide your teams with well-defined roles. So I invite you to go to this website, designguides.org, and you can download uh, this framework. It's a very, very simple framework. After that, you, have, you can use it to, de to, to decide upon uh, how you want to implement it in a company. And you have different roles, different teams, and remember that all those teams, they are iterative as well. 